Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Beautiful. Brother Mark. Hello, how's everybody doing today? Morning. Morning. Thank you for being here. Welcome to class, sunshine outside, nice pretty blue sky, what more do you want, huh? Some warmth, how about that, huh? <laughs> now, good, good to see you today, thanks for being here. Uh, John chapter 11, we'll go there for a little quick bite of a nugget there this morning, and um, let me read off the one change on our prayer list, or this is an addition, I think, Dale Kelly with cancer, so let's remember Dale. Pro, there's probably not a, a person here who's not either experienced cancer yourself or had someone close to you, maybe a family member that's had it. We've all, we're all very aware of what this is like. So when, we, And we have several on our, our list that's going through cancer right now. So we're adding one more. Let's, let's be in prayer for, for Dale today, plus the others, okay? Um, oh, uh, spe- so speaking of the prayer list, any... Please take a look at it. Anything that needs to be updated or whatever, make make those adjustments, all right, so we can keep it current. All right, well, John chapter 11. We're working our way up to the shortest verse in the Bible, which is, what is it, class? Jesus wept. What verse now? That's our verse we're, we're working towards. And so last week we looked at the who, we looked a little pick up right there. So where were Mary, Martha, and Lazarus from? Where were they from? Bethany. Bethany. So Bethany. So let's figure out where Bethany is. Uh, look in chapter eleven. Look at eighteen. We'll start in verse eighteen. We're going to be bouncing around to several verses. So just read along. It says, "Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem." about 15 furlongs off. So let's, let's just pretend for, for a sake of illustration, this podium right here will be Jerusalem. So we'll base every, all directionals uh, based here on Jerusalem, okay? So if that's the case, over here uh, about where Brother Larry Stover is sitting would be the Dead Sea. So you're the Dead Sea. <laughs> you're dead, see? <clears throat> all right. So this is about the, <laughs> this is about 20 miles. This would be about 20 miles away. The Jordan River flows northward from the Dead Sea up to what body of water? Sea of Galilee. About 150 miles. So it would be over there about where the Firestone Station is. Bethany is 15 furlongs from Jerusalem here in this direction. So how many um, furlongs per gallon does your car get? Bobby? <laughs> All right, so let's, let's convert that into something we can figure out. So 15 furlongs is about 1.7 miles, okay? So if I went out to the, the track at Boone, which is actually closed off for renovations right now, but if I went out there and I walked around the track, how many times would I have to walk around to get to 15 furlongs? Seven, seven times. Now, what would happen if I went out there and I marched around that track seven times? the walls of the stadium would come crumbling down, right? <clears throat> all right, so, so that gives you an idea. We've all walked around the track before, so seven times, that's how far. So about, uh, you would be Bethany right here. Well, let's go Bethany right there, right there. Right there's Bethany, all right? Except you'd be a little bit more that way towards the Dead Sea, but, uh, or I could do this. Now, that's a little better. This is Bethany, okay? So that's, that's where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were now we know Jesus, wherever Jesus was, he is not there. All right, so we've got to figure out where. Where is Jesus? So um, if we go back to John chapter 10, 
Sometimes, um, and, and I'm guilty of this too, we're, we're reading the Bible and studying it, and we get caught into a chapter as if that's some kind of definitive boundary around what's going on. And, and remember, chapters didn't get added in verses until about the 12th century. So uh, we, we always got to keep that in mind. So John chapter 10, we're just right before the events of chapter 11, verse 22, says, And it was at Jerusalem... The Feast of the Dedication, and it was winter. So we know the time of year this was going on. Verse 23 says, Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now, if we were going to GPS Jesus, we know it's in Jerusalem. It gets even more granular because it says he's in the temple, and he's standing on the porch. That's about as granular as we can get. So we GPS exactly where Jesus was in John chapter 10, right, right before the event we're studying, Okay. And, and Jesus starts to have this discourse with the Jews. And uh, let's see what happened. If you go to verse 31, as a result of the discourse that he has with them, it says, then the Jews took up stones. Notice the next word. What is the next word? Again, took up stones again to stone him. He has some more discourse with them. In verse 39, therefore they sought, and what's the next word? Again, to take him, and then it finishes off, but he escaped out of their hand. Everywhere Jesus went, if you read through his ministry in the Gospels, everywhere he went, where there was a crowd, if there was a big crowd, the people wanted to do one of two things to Jesus. One is, as we saw in verse 31 and 39, to get rid of him, to destroy him. What was the other thing that they wanted to do? Make him a king. They wanted him to be a king right then and there. So remember, those are the two things that, that seemed to happen every time he got around a big crowd. And every time either one of those things happened, he withdrew himself. He got away so that, so that those couldn't happen. Now, let's think that through just a moment. It, did Jesus come to die? Yes. Now, when it says the Jews took up stones in verse 31, this isn't Ernest T. Bass, all right? They're, they're not out there picking up gravels and, and, and tossing them. This was their method of capital punishment. They wanted to kill him. They wanted him dead when it says they took up stones. What, he, he, he did come to die. That, that was uh, foreordained before the foundations of the world. But was it, at the, was it at the hand of a Jewish mob to stone him? Is that the method? No. What about the, 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 at the hands of an angry mob, a, a riotous mob, where it says in verse 39, they sought again to take him. Was that the methodology in which he was going to die? No. Is Jesus going to be a king? Yes, lot, lots of scripture to tell us that. Was it the timing for him to be the king then? When, when they wanted to make him the king? No. So, so both of these things were true, but it wasn't the right what? Wasn't it the right timing? Is he always on time? Yes. Ever late? Amen. Ever early? In your life, in my life, does it sometimes seem like he's not on time? Does it seem that way sometimes? It sure does. All right. Now, verse 40. So he escaped, in verse 39, he escapes out of their hand. Verse 40. And he went away again. Notice the word again there. Three times we've seen the word again. He went away again. And what's the next two words? Beyond Jordan. All right. There's our Dead Sea. Jordan River flows northward, remember. He went eastward, beyond Jordan, into a place where John at first baptized, and there he abodes. T talking about John. What John are we talking about here? John the Baptist, who was related to Jesus how? His cousin, who was older? John. By just a little bit, but John was older. All right, so John was baptizing beyond Jordan. So now we see Jesus leaves Jerusalem. He leaves here because it's not his time to die. It's not his time. So he withdraws himself, and he goes beyond Jordan. What does beyond Jordan mean? He's on the other side now. So Jesus goes over the river. And through the woods. Da -da -da. All right, so Jesus is on the wrong side of the river now. He's about 20 miles away, right? And at that point, 
John chapter 11 rolls in. So, Bethany, beyond Jordan, where, where Jesus, where, I'm sorry, where John was baptizing. Now, they have to get a message to Jesus that Lazarus is here and he's sick. We mentioned this a little bit last week, but if you look in verse 6, verse 6 of chapter 11, sorry, chapter 11, verse 6, it says, When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, Lazarus was sick, when Jesus heard Lazarus was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. So he's over here, just about five miles north of the Dead Sea. That's where John was baptizing, on the east side, on the, on the other side. So he, he got, they got the message to Jesus somehow. Jesus stays there for two days. And then in verse 17, look at verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. So it evidently took Jesus two days to cross over the river. River is anywhere from 30 to 60 feet wide, can be up to about 15 feet deep. It was in the winter, so probably it was at its lower point. There wouldn't have been a lot of flooding or, or anything like that. Remember, it was winter from back, back in chapter 10. But, but he had to cross the river and had to go 20 miles. So it took him two days to do that, and there, therefore we have, by the time he gets here, Lazarus has been dead for four days. All right? Last thing, chapter 11, verse 7. So it says, in verse 6, it says, Jesus stayed there for two days purposefully. He purposefully stayed. He could have, he could have come earlier, but he didn't. Verse 7, Then after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. Let us go from here back over where we came from. And then verse 8, quite a statement in verse 8. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late thought to stone thee. Remember we just read that in verse 10, in chapter 10? We just, we just read that. That happened just right before they went over here to the other side of Jordan. And goest thou thither again? They were asking Jesus if he was, Jesus, are you really sure? Let's, let's do a time out here. Let's, let's, let's huddle and figure this out. We, we just got away from this mob, and now you're saying go back? Or, are you sure about this? The disciples were questioning Jesus? Good thing we never do that, right? <laughs> we never question him, do we? <clears throat> Questioning Jesus. Wow, a lot, of, a lot of deep things in this chapter, aren't there? We're, we're working our way up towards verse 35. We didn't looked at the who, the where. So we got a, we got a few more to go. Brother Dan, you're up. By the way, aim is getting better <laughs> surprise I'm back you thought you were getting rid of me didn't you no I found my way home I found my way back no that's not the surprise for this Sunday but it sure is good to see everybody we did miss being here but we had a great time I wasn't thinking very much about here where I was. I was staring at the water. My toes were in the sand. And it felt wonderful. That's cruel, isn't it? To do that, to say that. But we needed to get away a little bit, zone out, and, uh, and get refreshed. And then we had a, a time of, uh, we went to a conference down there. And uh, my soul, we heard some good messages. And, um, and man, I got beat up too. Uh, I think he was preaching right, several of them were preaching right at me. So believe it or not, um, those that teach and preach, they need teached at and preached at too. So thank you, Brother Mark. I appreciate that. That was great. Now we got a lot of moving parts going on this morning. You've seen... Um, some tickets. No, we're not going to raffle anything off. And if Brother Dave was asking you for a dollar per ticket, you shouldn't have given him a dollar. If you did, make sure that you get that dollar back before you leave. Uh, he was trying to capitalize on that, I think, a little bit, or he said he was going to. But we do, because it is Surprise Sunday, 
um, here in just a little bit, as soon as we get our tickets out, uh, we are going to give away, uh, and these are specifically for Sunday mornings, all right? Sunday mornings where you can bring your coffee or fill your coffee, and it has a spill-proof lid on it. So uh, we're going to give some of these away in just a little bit, and we're going to see who's going to win those. So this will be interesting. There's a lot of fun things that are going to happen this morning. That'll be one of them, and uh, we're excited about that. So what else we got? It's good to see Brother Tom. Sir? Uh, you can put coffee in there. Uh, truthfully, nobody will know what you'll have in there. But uh, Brother Leroy, depending on how you behave, folks will have a good idea of what you got in there. So, <laughs> But it's good to see Brother Tom. Keep him in your prayers, if you would. The process has begun, and uh, he had his port inserted, and uh, the chemo has started. Um, he's thankful to be here. He's thankful also that um, he's not as sick right now as he expected. He's just super weak, but he wanted to be here this morning. And so keep him in your prayers. And there's others that are on our prayer sheet and our prayer list that we need to keep in prayer. Now, this is the first Sunday of our spring campaign for Sunday school. We are, this class, Victory Bible, is part of uh, the yellow team. And the yellow team consists of Victory Bible class, home builders, foundations, and Spanish class, okay? So we want to win. And I did say we. We want to win. And so you say, well, Brother Dan, that's silly. I agree. Isn't it fun? It's so silly. It's wonderful. And it's just an incentive to help us get up and get out and uh, get under the Word of God, and it's a wonderful thing. It's also a great opportunity to uh, invite folks that perhaps haven't been in a while, and let's look at it from this standpoint. Sometimes it's very difficult, especially after the period of COVID that we just experienced and we went through, and some folks were forced to not be able to come. They didn't choose that. So now that they're able to come back, it feels very awkward. How many will testify to that? It feels very awkward coming back and because your mind... Now, nobody has said anything, nobody's insinuating anything, but you're very sensitive about the fact that you haven't been uh, in, in person. And so just think of, think of it that way. And let's, let us go and take that extra step towards somebody that perhaps hasn't, hasn't been able to be here in a while and then make them feel super comfortable about being able to come back because they feel awkward. They feel like, oh, my soul, you know, are they, are, what are they going to think about me? You know, that's how I would feel. And it feels bad. We don't want that to happen. And just know that if you're listening online or if you're here this morning and perhaps you've just now started to come back after a long while, we are super excited to have you back. And it doesn't matter how long it has been. Uh, in fact, uh, we feel really bad that things were uh, in such a, a way uh, physically and the, the sickness and everything that was going around that you had to stay away. And so we're glad that you're back. And, uh, and we want you to be here. So this is a great thing, and it's exciting to see the room full. Also, let me say that we have, um, we've added some chairs to the back of the room, but we've also ordered more chairs so that uh, y'all can be comfortable in here. Because these are bougie chairs, let me tell you. Uh, they're nice. They fit nice. They sleep really good. And uh, it's just wonderful. Um, all right, so Brian is going to be handing out those that need a sheet with verses on it. I had a request. I think we've got about 35 of them if you need to share, because we do go pretty fast. I've been advised by my administrative secretary to slow it down a little bit, Dan. Take your time, dwell on it. And, uh, 
and that is something that we do need to do, but uh, in case we're going so fast that you can't get to all the scriptures at one uh, at once, we've placed them on a sheet of paper, okay? Nobody's going to criticize you for not having your Bible open. You are holding God's Word in your hand, okay, on those sheets. So, we finished up, not last week, Brother Jordan did a great job for us, thank you uh, for being gracious to him. Uh, last week, filling in for me, he's a good guy, he's got a great heart, and, uh, and he loves to preach and teach. So uh, it was great to have him teach. Uh, but we finished up the week uh, before last, speaking of the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. So that is, in fact, the case. And we've seen that the Holy Spirit is both a distinct personality within the Godhead and that He is Jehovah God Himself. He's Jehovah God Himself. The Scripture clearly presents God as both one and three. Both one and three. The Bible declares that there is only one God on your sheet of paper in the very, the very beginning, you'll see verses, and I won't take time to read all these, but you'll see Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. You'll see 1 Kings 8 and verse 60. You'll see Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10. You'll see Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. Isaiah 45, 5 and 6. Isaiah 46, verse 9. And 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. And 1 Timothy 2, in verse 5, all those verses pointing us towards the fact of the Bible declaring that there is only one God, the God of the universe, and uh, so we believe that because the Bible states that. The Bible also declares of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit that they are each God. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We see the Father is God in, in John chapter 6. And let's, I'll, I'll read that briefly. If you have your sheet, you can look at it. If you want to look it up, that's fine. John chapter 6 and verse 44. The Bible states, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets... And who is writing this? Or who is speaking this? Jesus Christ. In the form, He's God in the form of flesh. And He is speaking this. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God hath seen the Father. Did you get that? Did you get that? He said, nobody has seen the Father except for the fact if you've seen He who is of the Father. He's speaking of Himself, Jesus. So folks say, well, we've never seen God. Have we? There are those that saw Jesus Christ in the flesh, so they have seen God. Because... Jesus Christ is God. See, we don't, we don't think of it that way, but isn't that kind of neat? <laughs> okay? Now, the Bible declares of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit that they're each God. Father is God. Romans 1.6, we won't read that. 1 Corinthians 8.6, 1 Peter 1.2, all those are in your sheet. Also, we see that the Son is God. Uh, let's look at John 1. We're in John, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word what? So the Word was God. God was the Word. Who is the Word? Jesus. Okay. Who is the Word? Now this, this is a little thought that I have not, my little puny brain cannot wrap around this. I've tried. I want to. I desire it, but it just blows my brain, okay? This is the Word, correct? 
The Bible says the word has become the word became flesh. And he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory, um, what is that, 14? Uh, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So if this is the word, and it is, the Bible says it's the living, breathing word of God. It's quick. That means alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it goes in and it discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. How can something that is an inanimate object do that? Right? Are you with me? It is a little freaky, isn't it? It is a little freaky. So, that makes you think twice when you chuck your Bible in the corner. (sighs) You say, well, Brother Dan, you're being weird right now. I'm just reading the Scripture. And the Bible says that God is the Word, the Word is God, and it dwelt among us. And he says that he is the Word. That is why the Word of God, when it is spoken, when it is preached, when it is is, is presented, it changes lives. An inanimate object cannot do that. Isn't that something? Everybody's going, "Mm, I don't know, Dan. (laughs) You're right on the edge there. But I'm just throwing that out there. My brain is having a hard time wrapping around this, but I'm just reading what I'm reading here in Scripture. But I know that the Son is God. Also, the Bible says the Spirit is God. Shall we look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14? Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It's asking a question there. And it's given us the idea that the blood of Christ through what? Through whom? Through whom the Holy Spirit offered Himself. He did it through the Holy Spirit. I'm just throwing this out there. This is interesting. Uh, Acts chapter 5. We go to Acts chapter 5 and verse um, 3 and 4. But Peter saith, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land whilst it remained? Was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Here you have God being referenced and the Holy Spirit as the same individual in one verse. Correct? So the Spirit is God. And there's many more verses. We have 1 Corinthians 3.16. You have 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What know ye not? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's read that one there because it references all that. Did I say 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 and verse 19? It's a temple of the Holy, Holy Ghost which is in you which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God. Well, you say, well, I thought the temple was of the Holy Spirit. Yes, they are one and the same. So you glorify God in your body. Not in your spirit, in your body. That's that's another thing, and we don't have time to, I like what Arianna says, to unwrap that in psychological terms. We don't have time to unwrap that, but we worship God. There's a way to worship God in your body using this flesh. Okay? And and we do that. That's why it's important how we live. Because it's a worship to God. But also, and in your spirit, and they're both God's. So the Spirit is God. There's many more verses that we see there. The Bible also teaches that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are three distinct persons 
or personalities. This is seen at the baptism of Christ where all three appear separately. I think we might have ended up here last week. But in Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. That's why we believe that the water baptism as a testimony of you and I that are saved, that have Christ in our heart, we are identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Baptism does not save one. It's not required in order for one to be saved. But it is a great illustration of you and I as believers identifying with He who, who saved us. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And we do that biblically with the example that we see here, in order to come up straightway out of the water, you have to have been straightway in the water. <laughs> okay? So that's, that, that, that is the example. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, um, is how he descended, and lighting upon him. I know everybody paints the picture that it's a dove. Well, no, the Bible doesn't say it was a dove. The Bible says it was like a dove, is how it descended. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. So you have God the Father speaking, saying, hey, this is my boy. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. So you have all three together in the same event. Uh, so we see three distinct persons or personalities. Number two, we see uh, this is seen in the sending of the Holy Spirit. The, dis the distinct personalities within the Trinity are evidenced by the fact that Jesus returned to the Father so that the Spirit could be sent to minister in His place. The Spirit is sent by the Son from the Father to speak, not of Himself, but only that which he receives from the Father and the Son. The Spirit does this not to glorify himself. So anytime, and this is where um, Baptist, we don't have to be afraid to speak of or teach on and, and, and take advantage of the Holy Spirit and his working in our life. Because any, it's just super simple. Anytime you see an overblown emphasis on the Spirit, you know that that's not really what God had intended or had in mind. So if you're in a service and there's this huge emphasis, or you're in a, a, a church that there's this huge emphasis on the Holy Spirit to the point that it's drawing attention to the Holy Spirit, that is not His function. His primary function is not to draw attention to Himself but to draw attention to God and to draw, draw attention to Christ. So um, he doesn't speak of himself, but only that which he receives from the Father and the Son. He does this not to glorify himself, but to glorify the Son. Where does it say that? John chapter 15, verse 26. John 15 and verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. So, God the Father sends the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So, the things that Jesus said, God the Father sends the Spirit to speak of those things. It's beautiful the way it's presented here. Um, uh, verse, or chapter 16 of John and verse 7, it is expedient for you that I go away, he says. For if I go not away, the Comforter, that is the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. So basically he's saying, I've got to go, because if I don't go, the Comforter won't come. All right? And uh, then in chapter um, 16 also, 
in verses 13 um, and 14, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, what is He going to do? He will guide you into all truth. I love that verse. I don't have to be afraid of being steered the wrong way when I'm relying on the Holy Spirit. When I'm walking in the Spirit, if you have Christ in your heart, you have the Comforter in your heart. We have the indwelling, the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Every believer enjoys that. Okay? When you're walking in the Spirit, as the Spirit would have you walk, you are going to benefit from that in that He will guide you in all truth. In all truth. That is available to every person. You say, well, that's only for... No, that is not only for specific people. The Bible's very clear here. For He shall not speak of Himself. Here we have it again. But whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. And He will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and he will show it unto you. So he takes everything that Jesus had spoken of, he takes all that, all that truth, and he will show it unto us. You say, well, Brother Dan, what is the difference between those that have seen it and those that haven't? Very simply, number one, it could be the fact that you are newly saved, or you haven't grown in the Lord yet. And as you grow and as you mature in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God will feed you from His Word. As we dwell in the Word, the Word gets in us, and that truth becomes evident. You've noticed that when you read your Bible, not just to check the chart, Okay, But when you read the Bible to try to understand it, and many times that could mean that you go back and you reread a portion and then you're still not getting it and it looks a little contradictory and so you read it again and, and you read it. It's, 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 it's like very much like when you're witnessing to somebody about being saved. And the Bible says, the day that they shall eat of the fruit, that day they shall surely die. And then the verse immediately following Adam and Eve eating of the fruit that they should not have eaten of, they continue to live. And somebody that you're trying to lead to Christ will go, well, wait a minute, they didn't die. So you reread it. Well, something died. Because all of a sudden they notice something. And then you find out that in chapter 2 and verse 24 or 25, why did God put in there that they were buck naked? It's so that we would notice in chapter 3, as soon as they ate of that fruit, all of a sudden they discovered something. Whoa! Why does that mean anything? Something within them died. And the Bible talks about two deaths. Spiritual death and physical death. They died spiritually that day because we know that when God breathed into man, that word breathe is actually the Holy Spirit of God was breathed into that individual. They had, a, at that point, they had eternal life. But something within them died when they chose to sin. So the Holy Spirit shows you those things as you dwell on that. Wow, time has flown. And I did not advance very much. But I did slow it down a tad. <laughs> These verses, though, they become nonsensical for those denying the separate persons of the Trinity because they say, how can the Son send the Spirit from the Father if the Son is the Spirit and the Father? Or how can the Spirit speak not of Himself but only what He hears of the Father and, and Son if He is the Father and the Son? Or how can it be better for the disciples that Jesus leave and the Spirit come if Jesus is the Spirit? How can the Spirit glorify not Himself but the, but the Son if He is the Son? Those are good questions, aren't they? We'll have to find out about that later, all right? Um, we've got to attend to some home, uh, some home business here. 
Um, everyone was given a ticket. Do we have the basket? Brother David Rush, if you will come to the front where everybody can see your hands move. <laughs> Brother Dave Rush gave out a lot of tickets today, so I don't think there's a way that you can remember the numbers and who had them, right? So, <laughs> tell you what, let's let Brother Mark pick. <clears throat> let a neutral party. Let me get mine out of my pocket. Pull that one out. You pulled that one out? <laughs> All right, so we, we need to give away some things here. Let's pick one. Right. Drum roll. And we go. We've got number 850189. Who has 189? All righty. You can, right after class, come up here and you can pick your cup. All right? You, you've got one. All right. What's our next number? Who wants oh, to pick one? Yeah, we got six of them. Oh, six. We got to get, we got to. Jump up and say, cold cuts, number 44, buddy. All righty. <laughs> number 850199. 199. All righty, Miss Beth, you can come pick one up afterwards, and there's some neat little colors up here, too. All right, we've got 850 219. 219. All right, Miss Jennifer, you can come pick up a cup right after Sunday school. Surprise. 850 184. Who has 184? 184. All right, Miss Bobby, come get your cup. As soon as it's done, we got four of them. We've got two more to go. 850216. Who has 216? All righty, there you go. Come on after Sunday school, you can get that. And then we have 850294. 294. Who has 294? 294, 294, 294. I'm not seeing that. Ethan, do you got 294? Good job, man. <laughs> Ethan stays in the crow's nest and. Uh, he helps us out every Sunday. He doesn't say much, but if he wasn't there, we wouldn't say much. Amen? Thank you, Ethan. And you can come pick up one of those cups. Thank you for being here. It's so great to see everybody. We'll see you in just a few moments. You don't want to miss what's going to happen in just a few moments. It's going to be exciting. Thank you. You're dismissed. <laughs>